morning. Um, this, this season, the church theme is about faith in practice, practicing our faith. And for this particular year, it is about worship. And this morning, I've been asked to uh, share about worship uh, relating to our offering and of our giving, in particular about our wealth, how we use our wealth. If I were to ask any one of you, would, would you rather be rich or poor? It's a no-brainer that everyone would prefer to be rich. If I ask how many of you feel that you are rich, there will be less uh, unanimous. How much is rich? How much is needed to be rich? And how should a Christian use his wealth? The Bible teaches us a lot about wealth and the use of earthly gains. Allow me to go through some scripture passage and some narratives to enlighten us about this topic. First of all, you have to know that God is rich. God is not poor. He's not here to take your money or need your money. God is rich. He is the God of abundance. And He gives. He gives good things in life. And wealth is such gain, one of such gifts. Bestowed for our benefit, for our enjoyment, and not for our ruin. Know that God is pleased to bless those who favour us with abundance of good stuff. Share the example in the Old Testament. When God chose Abraham, and God says, I, will, I promise you, you will be exceedingly rich. You will be exceedingly fruitful. You can find that in Genesis chapter 17. You will be blessed with fruitfulness. Three things. Three Ps. Yeah? You will be blessed with people. First P. People and posterity. Pos posterity, sorry. Ho tai. People. You will have multitude of offspring that will form nations of kings. People. Second P. You will have possessions or you will have place. You and the offspring shall have a place to reside in, a land that's everlasting for your possession. And it is a very fertile land, described as flowing with milk and honey. People and place. The third P is God's presence. You will have me as your God. I will be your God, and you will have my presence in your midst. So in those olden days, the ancient patriarch and agricultural world, the currency is not dollars, but it's in the form of land and in the form of offspring. And God loves the house of Abraham so much that he blessed them, he said, in abundance, every aspect. The greatest blessing, however, are not the earthly possessions, the place and the people and the posterity, but the eternal presence and the company of God, the giver, the living God. That's the third P. Singapore has secured the top position as one of the richest countries in the world, with a GDP per capita of 215K. We have economic dominance. And then according to the World Happiness Report in 2024, we are also Asia's happiest country. In the eyes of the world, we are so blessed. Perhaps you should also be asking, have we missed out on the greatest wealth and blessing from God? Do we really have God's blessing in our land, in our households, in our communities, schools and workplace? Should our desire be the fervor in our pursuit of God rather than the pursuit of our GDP and our personal happiness? The second point I need to raise is that wealth is also a double-edged form of power. The Bible speaks about principalities and powers. These are invisible forces at work in our present world, and they exert very strong influence over us. They also battle for our allegiance. The New Testament says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, we wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. People call money the almighty dollar. Almighty. Not almighty God, no, but almighty dollar. So what can money do? Well, with money, I can provide for my family and my loved ones. I can have a decent housing, food on the table, basic education and essential health care. I also have some recreational needs. This gives me some sense of security and some sense of peace. If I have wealth, that means a little bit more rich, 
I can elevate my status to premium service goods. I can receive premium goods and services beyond basic. For example, I can dine at finer restaurants. I can go on exotic vacations. I can assess opportunities for study and work. And I can afford luxury lifestyle. Some friends of mine recently went on a trip over a long weekend. And they told me that at the customs, people who pay additional cash to grease the pockets of officials, they were given VIP access. They can bypass long queues. That's very convenient when we have money. And so money has some inherent power. And because of that, wealth can be both a blessing and a curse. Depends on how you use it. So the third point I want to say is wealth can take over the place of our true and living God. The New Testament uses the word mammon for wealth. Mammon derives from the Aramaic form, and the meaning is that it is very firm, it is very stable. And this mammon is something that you will lean on totally and rely on, the only thing you lean on. Yet the Bible warns us that if you place your trust in mammon, then you have misplaced your trust. Because when you turn to mammon, instead of God, for security and for protection, mammon or money will ruin you. Ultimately, it will deceive you and ultimately it will enslave you. Mammon will deceive us into thinking that we have attained salvation. It will deceive us into thinking that we are very favoured by God just because we are wealthy, that we are better endowed compared to others. We will wrongfully think that our wealth is a special gift of God's approval. We may even believe that we can add to our own righteousness by giving money to the church, to the poor, and to others. This is serious deception because we have placed trust in what we have and what we can do rather than on God alone. The gospel informs us that we are made right with God not by our wealth, but by Jesus Christ and by what Jesus Christ has done. We are justified placing our faith in Christ. We are restored by the saving grace of God. Salvation is nothing that we can pay for or we can add to. Secondly, mammon also deceives us about our self-worth. We may equate our personal worth and our success with our wealth. How much, uh, when, we, when we ask somebody, hey, is that person successful? Usually we are just thinking about how wealthy the person is. That's another grave mistake. The truth is, all of us are actually equal. Equal in the sense that we are all sinners. Sinners, and yet someone that God has regarded as very worthy of redeeming. We are so valuable that Jesus gave his life for us. And therefore, in Christ, we are now the redeemed children of God, and we have an eternal inheritance. And so in Christ, we find our value. In Christ, we are already valuable, we are rich. Thirdly, the risk of being wealthy is that you may become desensitized to the needs of the poor and a disparity between the haves and the haves nots. Today we have enough. Today we have enough for everyone to live in dignity and wellness, but yet it is not happening. According to the United Nations statistics, it says 9.2% of the world's population is in a state of chronic hunger. And yet, at the same time, there should be enough. There is enough food to feed 1.5 times the world population. And so the root cause of hunger is not the scarcity of resources, but inequality and poverty. And therefore, we need to come back to God. We need divine wisdom to know how to distribute our resources rightfully as individuals, as a nation, and as a people of God. The other damning effect about this moment, about wealth, is when wealth becomes God. When wealth becomes your God, it enslaves you. In the Middle Ages, the term mammon was also used as a personified evil of greed and wealth. And Jesus warned his followers about mammon. He says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve God and Mormon at the same time. You've got to choose. 
When mama becomes our master, we're in serious trouble. Why? Because unlike our loving creator God, Mammon does not fulfill and it does not heal our soul. The more you pursue it, the more unsatisfied you will become with increasing needs and voids until it spirals out of control. John Calvin, he says, the love of money for its own sake will destroy you. It makes you last after material things. We become materialistic. And this pursuit causes us to feed into our destructive behaviours. We become more hungry. We become greedy. We become covetous. We are envious about people who have something more than us. And we keep chasing. We will disregard God's guidance about prudence, about moderation. We will give in to reckless attitudes, ultimately also lawless actions. It will ruin you if you pursue it wholeheartedly. Jesus teaches that true riches is more than material possessions. True riches is more than material possessions. He warned the disciples, be on your guard against all covetousness. For your life does not consist in the abundance of your possessions. And that's found in Luke 12, 12, 15. And there was a wealthy man who led an honourable life and he obeyed all the good Jewish commandments. He did not lie, he did not steal, he did not kill or commit adultery. He took care of his parents. He did not con others for selfish benefits. He came to Jesus and asked, what must I do to inherit life? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus looked at the man, he knew the man's heart. One thing you lack, one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor. Then come, follow me, and you will have treasure in heaven. Jesus knew this was one thing that holds the man. And this was the one thing that the rich man could not give up for God. So he chose to quit following Jesus. The Bible says that he was sorrowful when he left we can only assume that he forfeited his heavenly inheritance. Please do not mistake Jesus. Jesus is not dis- denouncing material possessions. Rather, it helps us to know that our wealth and how we use our wealth will reveal about our true priorities. If you have one million dollars, this Hokkien song, Na si wo ba mana, love that song. If you have one million dollars, how would you spend it? And how will your actions say about you? So the gospel also narrated a very intriguing incident about spending. There was a woman, she was not very wealthy by any means. Not wealthy. Then she go and purchase the most expensive jar of perfume. She broke it. She poured all the contents over Jesus. And this act likely caused all her life's savings. People were horrified. What a waste. Jesus, however, commended her for having performed a beautiful act. You said very waste, but Jesus said, praise, beautiful act. Why? Because this woman's actions show that she acknowledged Jesus for who Jesus is. She knew that Jesus is the Messiah who will sacrifice himself for her and for the rest of the world. She knew the measure of Jesus' true worth, and so she honoured Jesus by spending extravagantly everything that she had on Jesus for Jesus. How much are you willing to part with? What will you spend generously on? Our mindset and our approach will determine whether our gifts and our wealth becomes blessings or become deterrence in the economy of God's kingdom. The Bible teaches us to adopt a heavenly orientation toward our earthly assets. Okay. Earthly assets, but heavenly orientation. You say, what, what do you mean? So for this, we need to re-evaluate and revalue all things in the perspective of God's kingdom. Think back about God's kingdom, and if you reference God's blessings to Abraham, you will realize that you are currently enjoying a great measure of what has been promised to Abraham and his offsprings. 
you will realize you are indeed blessed with exceeding fruitfulness. On the promise of living amidst a household of great and noble people of kings, now in the Church of Christ, we are and we enjoy genuine fellowship with a global community of believers that belong to Christ. We have people and we have offspring. On the promise of receiving honour and status in Christ, we are no longer outcasts, but we are the esteemed children of God. On possessions, we have a stick in God's kingdom and we have a heavenly inheritance, inheritance that awaits us. On the promise of permanent residence of peace, we shall reside in joy, eternal joy and harmony with all creation when Christ returns and establish the new heavens and the new earth, just like in the olden days of Eden. On the promise of God's accompany and God's presence, Christ is living in us now through the Holy Spirit who empowers us in every way. If I were to check off all my blessings, I would say, wow, i am really got so much blessings that I enjoy in Christ. What more do I lack? What more do we lack? And so in view of what we have and what we shall inherit, how shall we utilise our earthly assets in this life? The Bible's principle is stewardship. Stewardship. It is important for us to understand that stewardship and not ownership matters. We do not own any of our resources, whether it is people, time or possessions or talents. These are God's gifts entrusted to us and we are to invest in them wisely as custodians of these resources. The Old Testament gives us a glimpse of how stewardship principles are fleshed out. I would say that these laws are economically gracious, economically gracious and holistic. They actually include things like care for God's creation, enforcing justice in the community, showing compassion. In fact, as you read them, they seem so out of place in today's self-focused world. I just read off some of these stewardship principles. First of all, there's provisions for the poor and the disadvantage. For instance, in olden days, if you were a farmer harvesting the fields, you must not wipe off or squeeze all the drop. You must not wipe up everything. Yeah. You must leave out the ages or the fields so that poor people in the community can also pick up and use it uh, afterward. This is the act of gleaning. And we read about it in the story of the poor widows in Ruth. For today's work, it just means that if you're the bosses, you really don't squeeze out the last blood and the last drop from your employees. And then there's provision for rest. For instance, the Sabbath observance. For a day in the week, the people must cease from all form of labour. And yet the purpose of this Sabbath is beyond just rest. The purpose of Sabbath was to have the day set aside to reflect about God's goodness. And then because you rested and you did not work, you have to trust in God to continually provide for you for that day, despite not labouring to produce output. And that's an exercise of trust. And in the Old Testament, it's very strange because the rest applies to the land also. It says that on the seventh year, the land also must have a year of rest, a Sabbath to the Lord, and tell them, do not sow in the fields or prune your vineyards and do not reap what grows out of it. And so that's the ancient practice of creation care, taking care of the land. Last but not least, there's a provision of jubilee. Every 50 years is to be the year of jubilee. And in this year, all the debts must be cancelled. And if you were a slave, you shall be freed from your masters. You have given your property as a mortgage to other people. The property must be returned to the owners. This kind of law, very strange and very hard to apply in today's world. But in, in fact, the purpose of Jubilee was for restoration. It is for a total reset, a reboot, to release people from the vicious cycle of poverty, of debts, of servitude. It also allows generations of people to break free and to have a fresh start and start anew. And so if I were to sum up, I would say the principles of stewardship will challenge us I challenge you and me to get involved in every effort that champion any one of these things. Efforts that champion these things. Care for our earth, care for God's creation, releasing people from debts, 
empowering the poor, giving dignity to the vulnerable, making sure you equalize opportunities for people under your influence, upholding justice and mercy. That's the Old Testament principles of stewardship. The New Testament gives us further insight in the person of Jesus, because Jesus embodies the true spirituality of giving. Jesus radically redefines what it means to be rich. His was an inverted paradigm. You know, we all go from rags to riches, that's success. Jesus' success is riches to rags. And you find that in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. For your sake, he became poor so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Jesus chose to leave the supremacy of heaven and to be born in the poverty of earthly life. This is the heart of the gospel, the mystery and the good news of Christianity, that God became man and entered our depraved world so that he may live and die for us in our place. If you can grasp that, you will see what an um, immense generosity. And so as Jesus' disciples, we follow his example. And the New Testament tells us, he says that those of you who can afford must give generously to support those who have, do not have similar means. You can find that in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 14. It says, Your plenty shall supply what they need, so that in return, when we become poor, their plenty will supply what you need. And so you ask me, why? Why is this sharing here and sharing there? Why? Because the generous mutual sharing is the way of God's economy. The generous mutual sharing is the way of God's economy. God is concerned that every member and every household in his family is adequately provided for and cared for to carry on life in dignity in his community of love. Why is this economy again? Why? Because in God's strange economy, the giver is blessed in return, if not more so than those who receive. The person who gives will be blessed in God's strange economy. And so we participate to manifest God's kingdom and bring the reign of Jesus in our communities when we share our wealth. To share our wealth, then I said, please nurture, start to nurture your spirituality of giving. And you say non-believers also give, and they're also very generous in their giving. And so what? Well, the distinction, we are all giving generously. And the distinction is the disposition and the rationale. Why we do what we do, and in what spirit we do it. So we're generous, and we're not tight-fisted to our neighbours. Because God has been extravagant towards us. And since God did not hold back in giving all of himself to us, our worship of God must embrace and must reflect this aspect of his giving of his life in us. So let me conclude by sharing some ways that we can start to practice this spirituality of giving in accordance to God's will. In ancient time, God's people would practice offering and tithe. They give a portion of what they already have back to God. Pastor Wilson expounded on this last week. And so I said today, Christians will also continue to practice this discipline of tithing and offering. Our cheerful and our deliberate offering serve to remind us that everything belongs to God. Serve to remind us about this principle of stewardship, not ownership. The next is to grow this heavenly orientation. You have to keep thinking, what... What can I take from this life into eternity? My car, my house, my certificate, my pay? None of this. What I can take into eternity, what we can take into eternity is relationships that we have formed. Relationships that we have formed given our time and our stay on earth. And so you have to invest generously in people. Use your money to bring the love and salvation of Jesus Christ to others. We will rejoice when we meet them again in God's kingdom. Invest for people to succeed in their lives. Invest to enhance your friendships and the communities that you live in. We bring glory to God when we exemplify God's or Jesus' selfless giving 
to make other people whole. As you invest, please also invest with care and discernment for good causes. For example, good causes that care for God's creation and God's people. I say that as good stewards, there's no room for lazy or careless giving. We can give, but you cannot be lazy and careless in your giving. Don't give just for the sake of give. You exercise due diligence and discernment to contribute to worthy ventures. I give some example. Huh? When you're giving money to charitable organisations, please do the extra to find out what more can be done to eradicate the root causes. What was the root cause of that situation? And importantly, avoid making the recipients feel indebted to you. Last but not least, practice some form of voluntarily giving up at times. Some of us practice this during the Lent period. We, we exercise this at giving up of something that meaning uh, that's very important to us. Yeah. So I'll say you will learn to relinquish ownership of your things, of your material things to God. Develop a grateful attitude that you are always continuously giving thanks, giving thanks to God. And learning to be content with whatever circumstances that we are and to appreciate what we already have. And if you were ever to give, give without strings attached to the people in need. Our ultimate treasure in this life is in Christ. What we do with our money is representative of how we have spent ourselves in this life. NM2. N M2. My organization chairman, Prof. Ho Yuki, he shared this with me uh, this, this week. Lah. I thought eh, I'll just share with you. So NM2. No money, no ministry. NM2. Yes, God is abundance, but God also wants us to contribute. Yeah, so no money, you can't do God's work. However, when we participate in God's kingdom and when we contribute, NM2 becomes another NM2. New meaning, new money. Yeah. No money, no ministry, participate in God's work, and then you find new money and there will be new meaning in people's lives and new in our communities. Eventually, we will all meet our Creator. Each of us are stewards and we will be called to render an account of our management to the owner and the giver. You will find that in Luke 16. Give an account of your work to God. Have we been good stewards of the treasures entrusted to us in our lifetime? May God give us wisdom to utilize our wealth and resources according to His will. Thank you.